Morning, morning, morning. We've got to talk a lot today. I'm very grateful for this privilege that we get a chance to get to God's Word. Uh, as a family, we've had a lot of exciting things happening in our family. Uh, yesterday, God moved in our hearts in a tremendous way as we saw our newest sister, Cameron, get baptized. Let's have Cameron stand on up. Stand on up, Cameron. Cameron is going to be a senior in high school, so she uh, gets to be here for a year and build a teen ministry and build her faith and get ready to go off to college, and she's rocking a VCU shirt, so I don't know if that means you've made a decision. There's a lot of people going to try to recruit you lots of different ways, but that's all right, and uh, we're so grateful just to see her make that decision to become a disciple of Jesus, and there's so many people that have poured their lives into her mostly her mom, which, you know, it's just amazing. You know, it was, Amy was just telling me that all throughout her pregnancy, all she ever craved was 7-Eleven Slurpees. That's all she craved all throughout her pregnancy. And yesterday was September the 11th. And it's just amazing how God, July, September, July the 11th. Different experience. Good morning. It was July the 11th. You know what I was talking about. I'm sorry. I love you, though. You're awesome. And we got free Slurpees. And you're God's blessing to all of us, to your mom, to this whole family. But you know what? One of the amazing things about becoming a disciple is now you have a hundred times more fathers, mothers, brothers, fields, houses, and with them persecution. Um, but I just want to let you know that we're all very, very proud of you. And let's wrap our arms around our young sister. Amen. Let's give God glory for doing that. We also have uh, an amazing uh, couple that's here with us, uh, Glenn Ford and Violet Mitchell. Glenn Ford and Violet. This is Glenn Ford and Violet Mitchell. We're very excited to have them here with us visiting. Welcome. Uh, we're so happy that you're here. I understand you're both from Jamaica. You're from Jamaica. That's, that's awesome. But they live in New York. You live here now. Aha, all right, cool. All right, we can cook together then. That's awesome. My family's Jamaican, and we can cook some good food together. More people to eat with. I'm so fired up. God is good. You are good all the time. And that's it. Like the sheriff said, some people, not so much. Uh, let's uh, also be praying uh, in a big way, uh, just for the Daniels family, uh, Tasma's uh, grandfather uh, passed away. And so uh, Carlos and Tasma are getting ready to get on the road to head down to Mississippi. Uh, also, please be praying uh, for Carlos's mom, uh, Mary Lee Bentley, as she just had a heart attack this past Thursday and is in the hospital. This is a very difficult thing for this young family to deal with both those things happening at the same time. Um, so um, let's go to God in just a few minutes uh, in a word of prayer for them. I also just want to make one clarification before we pray. Uh, in the newsletter, it says that today there's a Woodbridge block party at the Thorpe's house. At the end of the month, there will be a block party at the Thorpe's house. There will not be a Woodbridge block party at the Thorpe's house. And um, the Thorpe's other neighbors, which includes this wonderful couple right here, <laughs> Anton and his lovely wife, they, they, they would appreciate if the whole church didn't come today. <laughs> but they're planning on the whole church coming at the end of the month, or many members of the church. And I just want to remind you that Anton is also a police officer, so if we all show up, the police will be waiting for you there as well. <laughs> No, he's, he's an awesome, outstanding man. And, uh, but just want to make that clarification. There is a party, however, that the Thorps are having, but it's a smaller party that's by invitation. If you've been invited, you know about that. If you've not been invited, they'll see you at the end of the month. Amen? That's awesome. Um, so let's go to God right now in a word of prayer, and I'll pray for the Daniels. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for Cameron, our youngest little sister God that just made this choice to make you Lord of her life. Please, God, protect her faith as she's in high school, and please bless her faith this summer to grow and her understanding of you to increase. Please be with so many of our teens that are studying the Bible, uh, coming back from camp, 
coming back from uh, lots of time studying your word, God, being inspired to learn more about you. God, please help their faith to be built up. Thank you for the children's classes, for the preteen classes, the middle school classes that are happening right now. Please bless that in a great way. God, we pray for the Daniels that you can really be with them, God. I, I know it's really difficult to lose your grandfather. And as Tasma is saying, she just saw her granddad last week at the family reunion. And for him to pass away so quickly, that's so difficult. So we pray for peace. We pray for comfort. We pray for healing for that family. Uh, we pray, God, uh, that, that, that God, you would just be with Carlos in a great way, God, and really give him great comfort, God, as he supports his family um, through this very difficult time. God, there's so many of us that have long-term illnesses, many of us whose uh, parents, uh, brothers, sisters, and, and relatives and close friends are sick or have recently passed away, God. I pray, God, uh, that you would uh, just uh, be with us and give us incredible comfort, God. I pray, God, that you can be with Tim and Tina, God, as they get ready to move down to Virginia Beach, that you'd really uh, bless them in a great way, God, with all the details that go into that, God, and uh, be with them and continue just to work powerfully in their life, God, as they uh, draw closer and closer to you. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your compassion. God, today, thank you, God, for all of our friends and neighbors that have come out to join with us at service, God. We thank you especially, God, uh, just for the sheriff and for the chief deputy being here with us. Please uh, bless their time with us, and please be with us as we engage the community. And as we open your word, open our eyes so we can see you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn over the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4, last week, Phil did an outstanding job. Uh, like many of the teachers, I got a chance. We were at the ICMC last week uh, in New Jersey, um, uh, just right outside of New York City in Secaucus, New Jersey. So I didn't get a chance to sit in service, but all of our messages are online. You can go to our website or you can just go to YouTube and type in Potomac Valley Church. So I got a chance to listen to uh, Phil's message. He did a great job talking to us about the Sabbath's rest in Hebrews chapter 4. And we really appreciate how God moved powerfully as he explained that to us. I want us to continue our, our thoughts in the book of Hebrews. And in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may find mercy, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We have a high priest. There is no more temple in Jerusalem. The temple was torn down in AD 70, as Jesus prophesied that it would be. But we, who are God's temple, those of us that have made the choice to walk with God and been purified by his grace, we have the privilege of having the spirit of the living God within us. And we have a high priest. Not only a high priest, we have a great high priest. We have one who is greater than any other. Because this high priest is a high priest forever. And this high priest offers us something that no one else could ever offer us. And today that's what we're going to focus our minds on. Is the great offer that we have from Jesus Christ. If you turn over to Hebrews chapter 7 now, we're going to talk about what we have been offered that no one else in all of creation have been offered until Jesus came, lived, died, and was resurrected. Jesus is described as a high priest like Melchizedek. Melchizedek, we're told, is the king of Salem, the priest of God most high. He met with Abraham, and Abraham, when he came back from defeating the kings, gave him a tithe. So he paid him a tenth of the plunder that he got. And it describes Melchizedek, this anomaly for us in Scripture, as 
First it says, and this is in Hebrews chapter 7, it says, first his name means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, like the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Now Jesus is a priest like Melchizedek, but Jesus is radically different because he is a high priest forever. And he is our great high priest. And one of the things I love about God is he makes the message of the gospel simple for us people to understand. But then he throws a couple things in the Bible where you're like, huh? Melchizedek, the Nephilim, what's all that? God just does whatever he wants to do because he's God. But I won't take a lot of time today to talk about Melchizedek. That will wait for another day. I want to talk to you about the promise that we have through Jesus Christ, a high priest forever, in the order of Melchizedek. And I want you to skip down now to Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 11. It says, If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the law was given to the people, why then was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? So there's two different orders. For, then there was, for when there is a change of priesthood, there must also be a change of law. He of whom the... The, uh, he of whom these things are said belongs to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priest. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, meaning that he's from the lineage of Aaron, but on the basis of the power of the indestructible life. For it is declared you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus comes on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. And through Jesus Christ, we have access to live indestructible lives. Jesus says plainly, whoever believes in me will not die. Whoever follows me will live forever. That we have the opportunity to live an indestructible life. Brothers and sisters, here's what I'm here to tell you today. Everything we have will be destroyed. And we honor all of those that protect body and property that's around us. But everything here will be wiped away. Only God and those who are with God will remain. But in this life, we can live on the basis of a power of an indestructible life. A life where you can get knocked down but not knocked out because of God. Not because of you. Seven times a righteous man may fall down, but eight times he gets back up. The scriptures make it plain that no weapon formed against us will prevail, will prosper because of Jesus Christ, not because of us. I say this to you because we live in a world where people live powerless, destructive lives. I shared this briefly with these two outstanding gentlemen as we were in the children's ministry class. They get to see the darkness in Stafford. You know, when you're picking a home... You normally pick a home in a neighborhood that's safe, right? That's what you normally do. And if you find yourself in a neighborhood that's not safe, then you do all you can to make sure you stay safe. These men go where it's not safe. They chose to spend most of their days, their hours, in hostile territory. Many of you chose to do that in your service of this country, in your service to other people. As disciples of Jesus, when we study the Bible, we enter hostile territory. It is not safe to ask someone about their sin because one of two things will happen. They'll receive you and repent or they'll rebel against God and not like you. And sometimes our fear of rejection stops us from telling people the truth because we want to be safe 
instead of entering into hostile territory. But one of the things we have in Christ is the protection in knowing that in this life and in the next, we can live on the basis of an indestructible life. Now let me clarify. I am not saying that you will be rich. I'm not saying you'll always be healthy. This is not health and wealth. This is the power of God working in the disciple, the power of God's Holy Spirit that allows us to live indestructible lives. For us, we are not afraid of death. For us, we're not afraid of rejection. For us, we can be very bold because of Christ. I want to ask you to turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Because I don't like the barriers between us. And it's intentional. Because we're in this common fight together. I saw a brother in the hallway. He said, I saw you walking down the road and you looked really troubled, bro. Are you okay? I said, yeah. But I'm often really troubled, bro. The world's lost. And I got to pray. So when I come here, I'm filled with joy because I get to be with my brothers and sisters. When I'm with my brothers and sisters, I'm filled with joy. Even in difficulty, I'm filled with joy. But I can tell you, brothers and sisters, not every day will be happy for a Christian. But every day is indestructible for a Christian. Not every day will be pleasant. But every day we can have peace. The world does not have this. Second Timothy chapter 3. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. They'll be narcissists. The selfie generation. When you live in a generation where you're selling selfie sticks, you got to know. And if you got a selfie stick, I'm not hating on you. Rock your selfie stick. Just don't take too many selfies of yourself. Take selfies with other people. Just, you know, just, I'm just saying. It's a terrible time, man. Sometimes you don't look so good in the picture. I'm just kidding. You always look good. Sometimes I don't look so good in the picture. You know what I mean. <laughs> Terrible times. People just love themselves. People love money. Money is a great tool. It's a great servant. It's a horrible master. They'll be boastful, proud, abusive. When I was reading that, I, I, I paused. I lost my place because I thought about what Chief Deputy Decatur does, working with people that go through rape. You study the Bible with someone who's gone through rape. You know how hard that is. I really appreciate these, these men and the men and women that serve along with them. Some of you have gone through rape. There are a lot of girls and boys who get raped, who get abused. People are abusive in our world. The world is in a horrible place. But thanks be to God, we have Jesus. People are disobedient to their parents. We've got to teach our children to obey our parents. We've spent so much time on good enough parenting. This is not an exercise in futility. This is an exercise in training our children not to be like the world. In training our parents not to exasperate their children, but to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. It's an honorable thing for these men to stop by the classes because we live in a society where our kids are being told to cast off any respect for authority. When I went to school, where I went to school, the teacher got to beat you. And that was constructive. Now here, here's the thing. I'm not talking abusive. I'm talking about discipline. The kids in my seventh grade class were all out of line once, and I'll never forget this small little teacher. She said, everybody's getting a caning today. I was like, I didn't do anything. She said, I know, Archer, you didn't do anything, but you're in the class, so you'll get two. And I was like, okay. I'll never forget. She gave me one, and I was like, that ain't so bad. And then she must have saw that I was cocky. And this little, little woman, she just got down and put everything she had in the second one. And I was going to school in Jamaica, and I was like, as soon as she hit the, the, the second one, I hit the ground. I was like, I'm going to the American embassy. I'm going to protest this violent treatment. I'm an American. We're not having this. 
The American Embassy would have laughed me out of there. <laughs> Kids are taught not to respect authority. We teach our children to respect authority. But the first authority you got to learn to respect is your mom and your dad. Sometimes it's your grandma and your grandpa. Sometimes it's an uncle and an aunt. But you've got to learn how to do that. In our world, in these terrible times, people don't do that. People are ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving. The Christian cannot be unforgiving. See, forgiveness, to forgive, the weak man cannot forgive. The longer we get to be with each other, the more we're going to hurt each other. That's the nature of family. I'm going to hurt you. You're going to hurt me. We're going to hurt each other. But Christians, we have to forgive. Why do we forgive? Because we've been forgiven. We don't forgive because the person deserves forgiveness. Because you can always make a justification in your mind that I... Until they fall prostrate on the floor and pay me $50. You know, no, man. You got to forgive because Christ forgives. And that bitterness and that malice and that anger and that hatred that you nurse in your heart, it corrupts your soul. And you become contemptible in God's sight. Let's not do that. We live in a world where people are slanderous. Facebook. Twitter, Instagram, people slander each other, slander political officials, slander the police, slander authority figures, slander their fathers and their mothers, their brothers and their sisters. We can't be like that. Your Facebook, if Jesus looked at your Facebook, would it be what Jesus would say on your Facebook? Would it be what Jesus would say on your Twitter account? We've got to be careful not to get caught up in the world. We cannot be without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Verse 5 is where I want to center our minds for the contrast. It says, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sin and who are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these men oppose the truth, men of depraved minds, who as far as the faith is concerned are rejected. But they will not get very far because just as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. Brothers and sisters, this scripture is not speaking about the irreligious. This scripture is speaking about those who claim to be Christians but are not. You know, a lot of times we leverage our frustration at those that don't claim Jesus as Lord. We have to be careful, one, not to live out of frustration, two, not to be leveraging frustration, but three, we've got to be careful that we examine ourselves carefully. It says here that the people that live like this have a form of godliness. This morning in Stafford, there are lots of churches that are meeting, filled with lots of honorable people, with lots of honorable people that are preaching the gospel, trying to do the best that they know how, and we honor them. But there are also false teachers that are in Stafford today, that are in Woodbridge and in Fredericksburg and in King George. There are those who would gain control over weak will women, who take advantage of people. There are those who claim to have Christ as Lord, and yet their lives are categorically different than the standard of the scriptures. There are Janice and Jambreses among us, and we've got to make sure that the spirit of Janice and Jambres doesn't live within our own hearts. Because if it does, then we are living destructive, powerless lives. But if we reject this way of thinking, then we will be connected with the power of the indestructible life. I want to invite you to turn over to Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians 5, it's an amazing passage of Scripture. 
Paul explains to the Galatian church about the acts of the sinful nature. And then he talks to them about the fruit of the Spirit. Those who live on the basis of the power of the indestructible life have these fruits evident in their life. They have what it talks about in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Love. Joy. Not happiness. It's a trick. A lot of the reasons why we fall into sin is because we seek pleasure, because we want temporary happiness. People look at pornography in order to excite themselves or go to alcoholism in order to medicate the issues. But in those moments, there is happiness that people find. For a moment, you're like, I feel uninhibited, and now I am controlled. I feel exhilarated, and now I'm guilty. It is a gift with strings attached. It is rotten fruit. It is corrupt. For Christians, we've got to be careful that we're not pursuing being happy. Sometimes we tell our kids, all I want you to do is be happy. Sometimes you won't be happy, little Johnny. <laughs> little Susu, you won't be happy all the time. You know, I always want to click in my name. You won't be happy all the time. You, you, the interns know. I'm always like, hey, you know, we're multi-ethnic. Some people have clicks in their name. I don't have one. I always, when I go to heaven, I hope my name has a click. Will Archer. All right. You have joy. Christians have to have joy. Peace. Are you at peace, brother? Are you at peace, sister? Peace. How can you give people salvation if you don't have peace? What are you giving? You want to convert them into a frustrated life? You want to convert them into constant strife? No. Don't go and make disciples like the Pharisees and then teach them to be twice as much a son of hell as you are. Don't do that. You need peace. And if there isn't peace in your life, there's sin. And we have to repent of it. And you can repent. Patience. Things don't happen quickly. The older you get, the more you should learn patience. But sometimes the older we are, the more impatient we are. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, the Spirit that allows us to have access to the power of the indestructible life, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Brothers, if someone's caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. It's not a unique gift to identify sin. Some of us were like, I see the sin. This is not a special gift. <laughs> Everybody sees the sin. You know what a special gift is? Restoring people gently. Now, I'm not talking about softness. I'm talking about gentleness. Genuine concern from a place of peace and consistency where we don't tolerate sin, but we care about the sinner. This is hard because it means you have to crucify your pride. Because when you talk to someone and your pride and their pride clashes, it can be challenging. But as Christians, we can't be destroyed by that. We have to tap into the power of the indestructible life says, but watch yourself. I have to watch myself. Or else you may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens. And in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions. So that he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to someone else. For each one should carry his own load. Anyone who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with his instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please the sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. 
the destructive life in this life and the next. And the one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at a proper time you'll reap a harvest of righteousness if you do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. I've had a hard time this week keeping up with my runs. I came back from the ICMC and my whole schedule kind of got discombobulated. But I knew I had to get my run in last night. We'd had a long day, but I knew I had to get my run in. Because, you know, I got to see Julio at church and can't be showing up without your run time. But more importantly, I want to be trained. I needed the time with Jesus. I needed to reflect. I got to tell you, the first eight miles were difficult. But the last mile was joyful. Sometimes when you're walking with God, you get weary. And some of us sitting here in the middle of July, it's a weary time. The summer has sapped your strength. This year has been a challenging time for you. Don't grow weary in doing good. For some of us, we're energized. Watch yourself that you don't think you're something when you're nothing. Be careful. Be aware. Be alert. But be connected with the power of the indestructible life. I want to close out by inviting you to go back to Hebrews. For us. The two roads that stand before us are one of destruction and one of an indestructible life. As our brother Moses pointed out in Deuteronomy, we have before us blessings and curses, life and death that stands in front of us every day. And Satan works in a crafty way in our media, in our schools, sometimes even in our churches to muddy the waters and fuzzy the contrast. If you've not yet made a decision to make Jesus Lord of your life, I want you to know that you're destined for destruction. Straight up. Didn't miss it. Straight down the line. You got to get right with God. If you're studying the Bible, be urgent. Don't rush. Lest you miss dealing with deep and important things in your life. But don't waste time. Be urgent. Because the times we live in are serious times. We live in terrible times. And if you have any lack of clarity about that, fellowship with these two men. They'll tell you the goodness that is in Stafford. But they can also tell you the darkness that is in Stafford. And it is our job to spread the message of Jesus in this world. But not to become corrupted with the world that's around us. We have to be careful about the way that we treat and teach and train our children. We have to be mindful and with the fear of God, consider how we speak to our wife, how we speak to our husband, how we speak to our brother and our sister, because our Lord Jesus Christ is coming back, and his coming is sooner than when you first believed. And so we have to be urgent and careful and mindful. But we can also be greatly encouraged. In Hebrews chapter 5. It says in verse 7. That our high priest. Who was subject to weakness just as we were. And yet remained sinless. Our high priest who is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. In verse 7 it says during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears. He was not always happy. When they looked at Jesus, they said, you remind me of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. Brothers and sisters, we've got to cry for our communities. If you actually get to know your neighbor, you'll laugh, you'll eat, but you'll also cry. There's a lot of hurt in the world. And Jesus, he went to God with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, 
he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. We're told in scripture that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that we might declare the praise of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. As you get ready to go out of these doors, after we have a brief song and some great fellowship, I want to challenge you this week to walk in an indestructible way, to not be afraid of the world, to not be doubtful in the world, to live as a priest of God in the world, in the order of Melchizedek, not a priest in the order of Aaron, in a law that would not satisfy the requirements of our sin, but in the law that Jesus brings, the law that gives us freedom in Christ, a truth that allows us to know that no matter what, not life, not death, not angels, not demons, nothing, no power in all creation will stand against us, and that no weapon formed against God's people will ever prosper. If we live that way, we will live indestructible lives. But be mindful that you don't get caught up in the powerless, indestructible indestru living. If there's sin to repent of, repent. If there's peace to be had, reconcile. If there's change that needs to happen, make those changes. But let's walk as Jesus did. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Our God and Father, today we honor you, our worship. We come before you with everything that we are. We walk in the way that you call us to walk in. We recognize the darkness that's in the world. And yet, God, we know that your light overcomes the darkness. We recognize the sadness that's in the world. And yet your joy fills our hearts. We recognize the terrible times that we live in. And yet, God, we can be inspired by walking with you and gathering as a fellowship and reaching out to other people, God, and, and fellowshipping and learning and loving. God, thank you so much for the privilege to live, to serve in this community, God. Thank you, God, for those of us that live in Woodbridge, for those of us that live in King George, for those of us, God, that live in Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania, in other places, wherever we go, help us this week to live indestructible lives. Help us, God, if we've fallen down, to get back up. Help us, God, if we've lost our way, to find you, God, and to cling to you and to follow your word. For those of us that are struggling through difficult issues as we're studying the Bible, give us urgency, clarity, and conviction so that we can be saved. For those of us that have been saved, give us conviction and compassion, God, so that we would be gentle as we move among your children. And yet we would be firm as you want us to be, God. God, I thank you so much. God, I thank you so much that, God, you give us a life where we can have charity towards all and malice towards none. But at the same time, you give us a life, God, where we can be firm in the right as you've come to help us to see the right. Help us, God, please, by your grace, by your mercy, by your mighty power, transform us. Continue to lead and guide and direct us. And God, bless these kind men who've given their lives to protect our communities. Bless their children, their spouses, their families, their friends. God, be with them. God, and be with all the officers who serve and all who serve in this community, God. Put a envelope of protection around this community and yet God at the same time while we experience a time of peace help us to move urgently to deal with the real issues in our lives first and then in our neighbors second God guide us by your power we pray all these things in Jesus name amen